Hi, Mark. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Okay. I I hope I'm recording. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you are, too. Oh, yeah, I am. I am. Okay. If, if not, this will just be an enjoyable but private conversation. <laughs> no, no, it, it turned to the right thing. Okay. Uh, so you're here for a couple of reasons. One is that you're a distinguished uh, cartoonist, and I do want to talk about uh, your career as a cartoonist and your approach to cartooning. But the other reason you're here is that January 8th is the 75th birthday of Elvis Presley, which, alas, Elvis himself is not around to celebrate. So you're picking up some of the slack with the publication of this book, which I'm holding up, Shake, Rattle, and Turn That Noise Down, How Elvis Shook Up Music, Me, and Mom. And, uh, you know, sometimes, Mark, I, I, uh, I, I come on here and I'm talking to an author and do not profess to have read the entire book. I can accurately say I've read the whole darn thing. I'm impressed. Yeah, it's that a, must have taken a lot of, taken a lot of well, late nights. Well, you know, it's a subtle work. If you're going to appreciate <laughs> it in all its grandeur, it does, uh, it does take some time. But the fact that a lot of the space is consumed by pictures... Is a little bit of a time saver, I've got to say, because well, the pictures are get into the words. nuances of the pictures, of course. The pictures, I love your pictures okay. so much, and and you know one thing I wanted to ask you before we get into the king himself is, uh, do you have a way of characterizing your your art? That reminds me, actually, I was uh, uh, <laughs> there's a guy, there's a blog. I was I was reading a blog entry about you this morning. Uh, called the Schultz Library blog, named after Charles Schultz, and it comes out of the Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction, Vermont. Who knew? Anyway, it refers to your work as a singular vision that belongs to no school but its own. So um, with that as backdrop, let me return to the question I was going to ask you, which is, is there some category that your style of drawing um, fits into or... uh, I find it really amusing, and often it makes me uh, laugh for reasons that I can't really articulate. You know, is there are you part? Is there some particular school you're part of, or genre you're part of? Contrary to what this guy said. Well, I'm all in favor of all of your reaction there because um, I, I, I've I've always tried to be original, and I've always tried to come from an intuitive place. Um, and you know they usually say it's for others to categorize. Um, you know I'm 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 glad if people have that reaction that um, that that they you know that I you know I I, I tend to believe in uh, our internal mystery and uh, and the and the adventure of doing any kind of uh, artwork or writing I think is to try to discover something. So um, that's what I try to do. So maybe your reaction is telling me. You know, maybe I've succeeded somewhat. (laughs) I think you have. I mean, I don't think there's anybody's work that I'd get mixed up with yours. And I think if there is, it it would be somebody who who started doing it after you started doing it, probably. Um, And just I can credit some influences. uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Well, first place, my parents met in art school, uh, Cincinnati Art Academy, and. um, they were both gag cartoonists in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, whatever, um, and so I grew up um, around them and 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 you know their influence, and then and then looking at um, a lot, I can I mean I could name a lot of uh, uh, forgotten or or uh, not widely well known gag cartoonists from many years back that it was basically single panel gag cartoons. For some reason, I never got that gene. Um, I, I admired uh, Little Abner because um, because he was sort of caricaturing, creating and caricaturing this world, and had this great story strip. Um, I think I mentioned to you that I, I my my father was friends with, um, and my parents were friends with the Ketchums, Hank Ketchum, who who oh, created really? Dennis, Dennis the Menace, the Menace and, ah. and um, ah. so I actually knew the, the Dennis Ketchum when I was a kid. Uh, a you knew Dennis himself. And um, so, so I used to, you know, I read Dennis the Menace, loved that. I loved, loved Little Lulu. I love, you know, a lot Wait, of I ha- I comics. Have to, I have to pause and just quickly ask you, what was the real Dennis the Menace like? The well, you know, we were, yeah, I was, I think we were about six or seven at that time, maybe five, about six, we were probably about six or seven. And I, and I, I just remember um, he gave me, we gave each other gifts at one time, and he gave me this flashlight gun or whatever it was. And I remember, um, it was it's, a, it's quite a long time ago, uh, yeah. so I so I can't, I can't I can't say that I can give you a you know a 
careful uh, description of his of his personality. You know, he was a nice kid, and I think he, I think he he sort of um, well, I think he sort of got a raw deal in the whole Dennis the Menace thing. You know, he was he was the inspiration for the comic strip, and I think he. I think he got the worst end of it, but um, yeah, I heard that his life didn't was not the better in the end for for that. I saw. Yeah, I think he's still alive, but I I, I know I there was a thing about him in some tabloid um, some years back, and I read this, you know, where he was just he had a tough life, and and um, it's you know that's a but that's anyway that's a whole thing. But I did I did um, uh, you know grow up around a lot of cartoons, but. But basically, I, for well, some can I, can reason, I, I never pause? got the gag I, cartooning yeah, team. I was going to ask, now, a gag cartoon is just a classic single-panel cartoon? Single-panel, like and there used to be a lot caption. of magazines like that. Saturday Evening Post, Look, right. Collier's. My, my father famously, um, in the 40s, he kept trying to sell a, a cartoon to, the, to Collier's, and year after year he couldn't. Couldn't sell him a cartoon for many years until he finally did. And every year, the, uh, every year on the anniversary of his first rejection, he would send them a cake. And uh, <laughs> then they, they were, and then they started writing articles about the the cake that he was sending them. But eventually, he sold them. And th- th- that used to be a big world out there. And it, and now it's it's kind of vanished, except for the New Yorker. And mm-hmm. you know, it's and it's been revived a little bit in 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 some ways. But it's not it's not what it was. Um, okay. But I never got that gene, and uh, so I, I, I really I don't I don't do single panel uh, cartoons, and um, I mean I've attempted it at times, but but the thing that really um, uh, impacted me was when I was 14 years old, and oh, and I also I loved um, uh, this guy Ronald Searle. I don't know if you know his work, but he's a real genius, and uh, and I loved Steinberg, you know, and that was mm-hmm. a lot of that was this visual style of drawing, but the person who um, who really kind of impacted me in the biggest way was when I was 14 years old. I discovered um, Jules Pfeiffer's book Six Six Six, and right. uh, and he was he was doing he like he would have the guy stand there and just look right at you. And uh, let's see, I'm trying to look at the camera here, and now the camera is this little dot up here. Yeah, he'd look right at you and he'd just start talking to you. And and I and I and and people would have these conversations. And somehow I realized that. You know, a uh, a cartoonist could be a writer. You know, and and that and I, I somehow I had a some aptitude for writing from uh, from uh, in school. It kind of became apparent at some point. Mm-hmm. And, um, and and this teacher, Mrs. Faber, who makes an appearance in uh, Shake, Rattle, and Turn That Noise Down, um, is um, I mean, uh, she she actually gave us an assignment one time to write a, an essay about Halloween and. Suddenly, I wrote this thing that like everybody in the class or a lot of kids in the class wanted copies of it, and I, I so I realized I could kind of write in in you know write narrative. And then mm-hmm. uh, when I when I saw Jules's work, I I, I saw wow, you know, a, a cartoonist can can write like a writer, and you don't mm-hmm. have to just sit there and come up with this like joke that you know and punchlines. Um, and so that kind of opened me up to uh, you know, and then and then my uh, to to, to Kind of the way I wanted to approach it, and then um, over time, I, I um, the, the the other thing is is is, is tr- trying to go into a place inside of myself and and find you know discover something. So so that was kind of my approach. Now, just to for for our younger viewers who may not have been uh, uh, very attentive during uh, some of the some of the important parts of your career, um, you want well you you I. I I kind of think of you as having kind of burst on the scene with the Village Voice, with with at first uh, McDoodle Street and later Washington. Oh, is that wait correct? a second. Hold it. Let me just. I'm just going to walk across the room. I've got to get something. Wait. Hold on. Okay. Uh, this would be McDoodle Street, a panel from McDoodle Street in the Village Voice. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Here I am. No, mm-hmm. I just uh, this. See this book I'm holding out now. This is Who Needs Donuts. This is one of the original copies of it's it. It's a, a cult uh, classic. The, the Who Needs Donuts is something I did in 1973. I, I illustrated my first kids book in '71. In '73, I wrote a book called Who Needs Donuts. Right. And um, so that was really, uh, and that was out of print. For, that that was in print for about ten years, and then it was out of print for quite a while. And people would, um, you know, write to me trying to find copies of it, and um, I, I had like a you know a couple of boxes of copies, and once in a while I'd sell one or give one away, and then finally um, 
in two th- just about approaching the 30th anniversary, I I, um, I I I put one up on Amazon, offered it for five hundred dollars, and uh, signed you know first edition, and somebody in California bought it, mm-hmm. and it ended up then that Knopf Random House. Um, Republished it in two thousand and three. The prestigious and, publisher Knopf. I'm sorry. Oh, I said the prestigious Knopf. The prestigious soft fit to publisher work. Knopf. Yes. They're wonderful too. They've been very nice. To and me. they published this as well, Shake Rattle and yes, so on. They did. Yes. And and, and um, so so who needs donuts uh, precedes uh, your 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 work at the Village. Medicine? I was originally in doing children's books, and mm-hmm. uh, from when I came out of art school, I went to Cooper Union. Graduated uh, in 1969, which is, of course is you know like I we we had um we had tools back then, but uh, you know simple <laughs> tools. But uh, and who who needs donuts is ultimately about love, or, or if I remember correctly, or well, yeah, I was basically in 1966. I was uh, I was in my I was at Cooper Union, and I I used to you know carry a sketch pad around and and just sort of I, you know I was really just totally fascinated by. New York, and a lot of what Who Needs Donuts is about is, uh, you know, the kid comes from the suburbs into New York, and um, so I, I, I was, I, I always had a sketch pad, and I was always looking for characters and ideas and whatever. And one night I was in a Bickford's coffee shop on Third um, Avenue and Twenty Third Street. It was open all night, and um, there was an old woman there who was kind of like looked like she was asleep on the counter, and uh, she was just kind of leaning over the lying over the counter, and she didn't say anything. And I was I sat down, and it was about eleven at night, and I was like looking around and had my pad there, and just was you know whatever. A guy comes in, a uh, well dressed man um, says uh, he'd like two cups of coffee to go. The waitress says, "Would you like donuts with your coffee?" And suddenly this old woman lifts up her head, points up at the ceiling, and says, that's right, who needs donuts when you've got love? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I wrote that down, and I, I put a, I was living in a boarding house at that time for the three years, uh, those, for three years of art school. I, put, I made a sign and put it up on my wall in the boarding house, and people would come in my room, and they'd look at it and laugh and whatever. And about five years later, I was trying to think of uh, what I would write a kid's book about. And I yeah. thought, why, well, I would love to. I had always wanted to kind of mo- immortalize her, uh, mm. that woman and her quotes. So I, uh, I wrote a kid's book based on that quote. Of course, there, there is the alternative view. Who needs love when you got donuts? There's, <laughs> there's something to be said, frankly, for that. What? I said there's something to be said from that for the, for that perspective, but I, I, I'm, it's not I'm, I'm not a big proponent of that one, but uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, I can respect good. it. Donuts are pretty good. What? But I think donuts are pretty good. They, but anyway, well, that, you know, that's a whole other. See, I, that's a whole other blogging heads. I think about if we if we want to <laughs> get into. I that. think you're right that we're getting pretty far <laughs> afield from Elvis Press. So before we get to Elvis Press, no, I me, just and and also the philosophy of uh, about donuts and love. That's a deep one. I don't, I don't know if I can. It is. It is a deep one right now. It is a deep one. Yeah. It, it's uh, there's a reason that that the donut is also a symbol for infinity. It's just their depths. <laughs> See here, they're, it's just endless. So so I yeah. That's that's a whole other yeah. Infinity yeah. is endless. Yeah. Here we yeah. Go, yeah. So just to quickly before we get to the king himself. Yes. Uh, recap. So, so you started uh, writing f- for uh, for the Village Voice, and this is back again for our younger viewers. The Village Voice was kind of the you know, well, I don't know if it was the countercultural uh, periodical in New York during a period of tremendous ferment, but it was certainly, the, I guess, the best known, the one that went kind of national in a certain sense. It was the place to be, and, and, you, were, and you were doing uh, these uh, originally uh, McDoodle Street, I guess a play on McDougal Street, which is a street in Greenwich Village. Yeah, where I lived. I lived on McDougal Street for okay. 22 years. Okay, and it and it had. And by the way, I can I will you remember what you're saying if I interject something? Yes. Okay. Now, number one, um, you know, so I was a huge fan of Jules Pfeiffer, and when I first came to the city, of course, I then suddenly I could purchase the Village Voice for fifteen cents, and um, there was, you know, Pfeiffer was the, you know, was a big star of the Voice, so that was, you know, every week I looked forward to seeing Pfeiffer. So that said, in my, that had, you know, established something in my mind about the Voice, and you know, continued to. About cartooning, there was also I was a big fan of Gene Shepard. If you know on the radio, I don't know if he he was a radio genius. He also wrote and narrated and made a cameo in the movie. I think it's called The Christmas Story, 
which is based on a lot of the things he used to say on the radio. And um, I actually once wrote him a letter that he read on his radio show. But so when I came, so he used to advertise the Village Voice and talk about the Village Voice. So I grew up on the Jersey Shore, and I was so anxious when I came to New York to read the Village Voice every week. So this was, you know, if from the beginning of when I came to New York in 1965, I was I had a focus on the Village Voice in one respect or another. So I just thought, thought I would. So it was kind of the realization of a dream, I would assume, when you when you wound up with your own space. To be a colleague of Jules Pfeiffer, and I remember the first time I met him, I'd been in The Voice for about ten weeks, and I was at some design thing or something. I got introduced to him, and I said, uh, and somebody, and I, I knew who he was, and I said, I shook his hand, I said, I'm honored, and he said, I'm honored that you're honored. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good line. Yeah. That's a very good yeah, line. Jules, Jules comes up with great lines, by the way. He's, yeah, well, there's a reason he's Jules Pfeiffer, yeah, you know? That's how he got to be a legend. Yeah. yeah. So um, so anyway, this, this McDougal Street had this kind of odd, chaotic uh, texture. The, 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 uh, the aforementioned blogger uh, said... When, when he, when he, about this, when he reads, uh, McDoodle's, and, it, and there's a book version of it, by the way, and he's talking about this, he says, Yeah, it's, it is, there is a book, it's sort of, you have to really hunt says, for it, but. Yeah. He says, and he's a big fan of the strip, McDoodle Street, and he says, It often feels like Stamity is barely in control of the strip, like a parade marshal who could be trampled at any moment by the odd and untamed menagerie that follows him. It's a funny and thrilling spectacle that has more than a whiff of danger. So, um, and, you know, Jules wrote the um, the introduction to uh, to, to the book. that book, by the way. But anyway, yes. Yeah, and so then and then you went on to do uh, Washington, right? Right. Well, well, well in voice. between that, I did a very personal strip. Actually, I, I did um, right, right after as I was coming. I don't know. At some point, my my father died, and I and I was also I sort of got this kind of. I got very kind of stuck in my work in some way, and I and I took a little time off, and then I came back, and I did a very experimental strip for a year called Cartoon, which was never in a book or anything, but it was a very valuable period in my work because I had to overcome a certain kind of um, sort of inhibition I had developed, and I really kind of had a, like, um, anyway, so that was, that was a very experimental what, strip. What, what and in the, the midst end, what, of doing that, the book of McDoodle Street came out, and Meg Greenfield called me up uh, from the Washington Well, the Washington Post wrote a nice review of, of McDougal Street. And Meg Greenfield was a, was a reader of, um, a, she read The Voice every week. And, and she, she was the editor she, of the op-ed page. Yeah, I was going to say that. She was, the editor, she was the editorial page editor and right. the op-ed page editor of the Washington Post. And she was, um, you know, a very important, powerful lady. And um, she was a very complicated person. But um, in, in certain respects, and... You know, uh, in certain respects, she was really great to me, and um, and uh, so she wanted me to do a McDoodle Street version of Washington. She she called me in, and and we had this big meeting, and then she called in, you know, some other powerful editors mm -hmm. and all this, and uh, so basically, um, but basically, she wanted me to do that for her op-ed page, and so I, I I didn't really want to be a political cartoonist mm -hmm. because. Um, you know, I was a baby boomer, and um, and I, I kind of had trouble with political, very very political people uh, during the ba during the '60s because you weren't really allowed to think anything. You know, you you were supposed to suddenly like everybody was supposed to be a leftist, and everybody was supposed to, you know, like suddenly things like the Boy Scouts were bad. Of course, now this was before the years of Boy Scout homophobia, <clears throat> but I had had a great time in the Boy Scouts. Well, you know, in the '60s, the Boy Scouts were a you know, called a paramilitary organization, and every everything you know, and it was ho 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 chi man, NLF is going to win, and all this stuff. And and I, you know, I admired the soldiers for one thing. I I mean, I you know, a lot, they got they were getting drafted, and and uh, I always admired you know guys who dealt with that. And you know, of course, all the you know everybody had like there were like seven things that you were supposed to believe. And if you didn't buy into all of that, you were called a fascist. So mm -hmm. I was, I was, if I would ever say what I, you know, just anything that strayed at all from this rant that we were supposed to have, mm -hmm. then I was, you know, then you get called a fascist. So I didn't really want to be a political cartoonist and get in the middle of this and have everybody, you know, have all these rigid people calling me names and whatever. And, and yet, uh, so, but it was very intriguing to learn, I, I, to learn subject matter. Like this was a chance to learn a lot of stuff, which was something that really interested me. And so I spent, 
I, I don't mean to go on for. I just I just I spent a, I did a lot of research for this. Like I went to a billion congressional hearings. I had the Post helping me get access to the White House and to this mm-hmm. and that. And and um, and then once the strip started and it was on the op-ed page, you know, suddenly I had fans who were like working in government. They were congressmen. They were all the you know there were people you know that worked in departments who knew specialties and everything. So I suddenly had the, the chance, like Herb Block did, actually, to get really informed. And I would say that, uh, you know, I was living in Washington when that was running in the in, in the Post. I don't know how long the run was, but for part of it that... Was, it was, well, it was 12 and a half years in yeah. the Post, and it was two years in Time Magazine. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I think it's very safe to say that it was the most absurdist political cartoon regularly appearing in a major American newspaper, well, right? thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I would think you would take that as a compliment. I do. Oh, absolutely. No, that was... No, it was quite edgy, I thought, for them, for, for the Washington Post. <laughs> you know, you compare it to Hair Block at the other end of the spectrum, and I mean, this is clearly something different, and something <laughs> different from every other political cartoon in, in a newspaper I was aware of. Um, and I remember the... the, the the thing that sticks with me above all is uh, the name you came up with for that guy, Senator Bob Forehead. Yeah, actually, people he was he was actually a congressman. You're, you promoted him. Oh, really? It wasn't Senator? He was in the House of Representatives. Really? Do, but do people remember him as a senator? Well, sometimes people say senator, but yeah. he was a congressman. Congressman Bob, Bob Forehead, Forehead. he was the uh, chairman of the JFK Lookalike Caucus in the Congress. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, again, there's just something very funny about that name. Uh, I think I once asked you w- w- about the origin of it, and there was right. a surprising lack of calculation about it. I mean, you said I, earlier I can, you worked very intuitively, and I recall this as being an example of that. Sometimes this has, so you know, it's funny, because uh, prior to that, when I was t- developing this thing, I was going to make this, like, forlorn uh, Democrat congressman, um, who was, you know, you know, a, a lost liberal or something. And I had this name that I'd worked and worked on and whatever, whatever. And um, what happened was basically that I, 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 there, there was this, this um, issue of the, um, of the Washingtonian magazine that had Jack Kemp on the cover, and there was all this stuff about, you know, the Kennedys of the right or something, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and this just really, I just thought this is just so ridiculous, and it's you know sort of style over substance, et cetera. Now, mm-hmm. now Jack Kemp was a much better person than Bob Forehead, but basically, it started. I, I read this article about these Kennedys of the right, and I also had been noticing that 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 the um, that in Congress, the Kennedy image had kind of become this 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 big thing in among congressmen. You know, blow dried hair and all this stuff, and and a, that certain look. I remembered, you know, when I was a kid, I thought, you know, President Eisenhower was the only president forever. And then suddenly, you know, Kennedy was elected, and he was this completely other image, you know. And then I remember that, you know, just how we just fell in love with his image. And I remember, you know, the assassination was so traumatic. And I remember even after Chappaquiddick in the 70s, there was always this, like if a magazine wanted to sell, cop, you know, sell issues, They'd have a cover that would say, Will Teddy Run? And this was after Chappaquiddick, you know, and there was yeah. this, there was yeah. such a nostalgia for this, the style of, of, of John Kennedy, and, and, and it was such a, you know, a trauma. So, and it seemed like all, and all these Republicans were in love with that too, and all these supply siders, and of course, mm-hmm. they used this, this Kennedy idea about, you know, Kennedy cut taxes and a rising tide, you know, lifts all ships, and they, 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 they managed to like, you know, um, make Kennedy uh, a supply cider in their in their myth, you know, or whatever, whatever. But in any case, so I just found that all so kind of ridiculous. So I, I was I was basically I, I I read that article. I'm thinking about this thing, and I uh, and I had been so impacted by Kennedy. So this was something I had a real passion about, and this kind of so so I just started. I was just walking around my apartment, and and it popped into my head. Bob Forehead. Now, it was not calculated. It didn't have anything to do with his haircut. People have said to me, you know, oh, it's because he's blow-dried and it's this and that. It was, not, it was just, it popped into my head. I was trying to think of a name. Popped into my head, Bob Forehead. I said, that's the name. You know, because it's just, it's a ridiculous name. And, you know, sometimes you just, when you're trying to come up with something, you just go into a space in yourself and, and there's a vacuum and something comes in, you know, and that's what happened. Yeah. 
Uh, and, you know, it's funny. When I told Meg that I had a character named Bob Forehead, that was when she first realized, hey, this kid is on to something. You know? <laughs> so so it's, it's, yeah, I mean, um, uh, I, I yeah. do believe in the mysterious, it, it's, um, intuitive it's a, um, aspect of the creative process. No, it's a great name because it makes the point of how cosmetic things had become, but it does it in an absurdist way. That a lot of names wouldn't have. Uh... Yeah, it was just, it was just, it just, you know, it was just like, yeah, exactly. And it, and 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 um, it was all Bob was all about style over substance. And he, as time went by, he just became more and more of kind of a political garbage can. You know, it's just like every cheesy uh. thing, every just all the worst sides of politics. And of course, we see there's so many people in the, you know, in in politics who run on that stuff. Who, yeah. who you know, so. So he would, you know, whatever cheesy um, maneuver uh, politicians uh, make, you know, Bob was uh, right there, you know. He was in the forefront of cheesiness. Yes. Um, now, so in the interest of, of getting to Elvis himself, I'm yes. going to leapfrog over a... a can so, can I do a phonetic... I want to do a phonetic um, neuromarketing um, little thing here with the title. Sure. Well, first let me mention oh, okay, that okay. Uh, you, you were, for a while, you ran, the, you, you, you had a, a, a strip on the back page of the New York Times Book Review. Then you started doing stuff, or around the time you started doing stuff for Slate, which you still do. People can still find your work. In fact, I, I, I clicked on Slate today, and the lead story was being uh, illustrated by a Mark Allen Stamity yes. um, image. Slate, so anyway. Slate, Michael Kinsley and Slate, uh, you know, Michael Kinsley was was a fan of Washington. He was always right. he was always wonderful to me. And you well, know, I, I would like to propose Mike Kinsley for sainthood. sainthood. Yeah, a lot and, of people would. I yeah. agree with that. And his sensibility meshes very well with yours. He has a, a, an absurdist streak himself. And uh, and in fact, I met you through through him in a sense. Exactly. At a slave well, Mike retreat. Kinsley is a great great guy. Yep, it's all true. Um, so okay, and intimidatingly now, smart. Definitely, definitely plenty brainy. Disturbingly so. Um, now, uh, so you wanted to do a little viral marketing thing? Or uh, no, no, I guess it's neural marketing. I'm going to just, go? well, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I should, I should, ref, you know, uh, I, I should restrain myself really on this thing, but I just, uh, on please, this, um, please do a little, I, I just, I just do the, the title with a little um, Elvis intonation. Okay. Oh, shit. Oh, Turn that noise down! If that thing doesn't go viral, Mark, you know, doesn't that go, there is, is isn't no that how you imprint people's brains like with with like? Isn't no, that, is that something about uh, neural marketing? If I were, if I were under, Knopp, I would go ahead and order the second printing. Great, great, great. Like <laughs> this, everybody's just gonna, they're just never gonna forget that. Man. Never, no. never. Yeah. And you know, we heard in there that you do have a, you do a pretty good uh, imitation of the king, and that is ultimately what the narrative uh, framework of this book is about, right? I mean, I, I assume this book is, it seems to be based fairly precisely on your actual experience uh, becoming an Elvis fan when you were a child in the 50s, exactly. becoming uh, one of the very first Elvis impersonators, <laughs> I, might, <laughs> I might say. 1956, uh, 57. 57 right. was my... And I don't want to give away the, uh, I don't want to do too much in the way of plot spoiling, but certainly there is a, a culminating performance by you in this, which, which I guess is somewhat grounded in reality. And, and certainly your, um, your mother's a, initially uh, averse reaction to, yeah. uh, to Elvis Presley. Well, let me, let me, a uh, uh, little, little image of your mother that, that, yeah, might, that might make the point. I'm holding this up. I think people will get the picture here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh. She, uh, the, uh, so, so tell me a little about, I mean, clearly Elvis, uh, again, his 75th birthday is about now, and, uh, he really, I can tell not only from this book, but in some emailing I've done with you, you really care about this guy, right? This was, this was somehow very important. You know, when, when Ted Kennedy, I, I think I remember this correctly, you might tell, when Ted Kennedy did the, the, um, the eulogy for Robert Kennedy, he, I think he, well, the way I recall it was he said something like, um, you know, don't, it's like don't make a myth out of him like you did with my brother, you know, with John and all that, whatever. That's just right. he said he should be. He said he should be something like he should be remembered as a good and decent man 
who saw wrong and tried to write it or et cetera. He didn't he right, it was something right. like that, right? It's that like bring him down sure. to earth. He was what he really was was good enough. You don't right. have to make him into some myth. Right. Yeah. And that's the same thing about Elvis. You don't have to make him into some myth. I think I told you I, I, I wrote you an email about I visited a school recently, okay, and uh, and I, I spoke to, I showed my Elvis book for the first time to kids at a school, and I, I spoke to five different classes, and there was there was one kid, and I asked kids, you know, what do you know about Elvis, and some of them said, well, he died on the toilet, and some of them said, oh, he played the guitar, and he sang or something, and one kid, a, a, a white fifth grade boy, who was, I was told both of his parents were musicians, he said, he stole music from African Americans and killed them. <laughs> and that, that's you know, going too far. You know, it's like, come on. You know, it's like Elvis Presley was not a racist. And yeah. and and you know, then there's and and I, I sent you this article from Jet Magazine, August first, nineteen fifty seven. They sent out a black reporter, talked to a whole bunch of black artists, you know, musicians, other people who'd known Elvis, right. none of them could imagine him saying something like that. He went and spoke to Elvis himself. Yeah, well, well what, what that article did was squelch a rumor that I didn't even know existed, yeah. but apparently at the time there was a rumor that Elvis Presley had said, using the word Negroes, which was then the most well, no, 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 no. I don't know what they use in there. The, you know, some versions of that quote were with the the, yeah, no, the vicious N word. That part, that was, yeah, no, no, no. That part was not the problem. Yeah. The problem was what he said in the. He had allegedly said something like, "All Negroes are good for is buying my records and shining my shoes." That yeah, was the and, allegation. And there was never a source for that. See, the thing is, about three or four years ago, a black woman friend of mine. You know, when I told her I was working on this Elvis book, she was sort of like not. She liked Elvis, kind of, but she was always wary of this. She grew up right. in the South, um, you know, in the fifties, and and basically, you know, she had heard that about Elvis, and I, so I, you know, I looked this up. You know, there were there were and 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 essentially, um, there was never a source for that. It was yeah. always a rumor, um, only a rumor. Um, no good journalism ever found a source for that. There was a white-owned black magazine that said um, that uh, that quoted it. That said it was it was rumored that he said right. that there was a rumor in the black community. That's the only time it had ever appeared in print before the Jet article. But uh, you know, apparently to this day, Mary J. Blige and some others um, still believe that Elvis was a racist, and it's terribly unjust because Elvis Presley was white male. Mm -hmm. Born in Tupelo, Mississippi, grew up in Tupelo, Mississippi, and Memphis, Tennessee, in the times of the most horrific racism in this country, and he was not a racist. And he recorded, and that's, and he should get a little bit of credit for that because so much of human, human, so many human beings function on a herd mentality. You know, and, and I mean, how many mm -hmm. of us, you know, challenge whatever? We're at a party and somebody says whatever they say, and how many of us want to instantly be a contrarian and have right. everybody in the room, you know, hate us or whatever? Right. It's, here was Elvis, you know, running contrary to 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 the racism that surrounded him, and he deserves credit. Right. And also, Sam Phillips, who was the owner of um, Sun Records, which mm -hmm. first recorded Elvis, Sam Phillips was devoted to. I mean, he he started his his company. Based on wanting to record uh, black musicians, uh, you know, and 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 give respect to, to black musicians who and 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 he and he wanted in that way to do his his effort toward you know equality and civil rights and and you know the idea that people you know have uh, make these accusations about Elvis and have these sort of prejudiced ideas about Elvis is just not fair. And yeah, that's but let me can, can I throw out a theory as to how the rumor would have arisen? Which is that, um, you know, you emailed me a couple of links uh, of his very first national TV appearances. This is in 1956 right. on a show, uh, on a Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey show, right. I guess. And uh, I listened to four songs, some of which uh, I had heard, I guess including Shake, Rattle, and Roll, maybe. But um, I was struck by how... Um, Consistent. What they reminded me of was a, a a special the PBS did on the blues by Martin Scorsese. Yeah, yeah, uh, I know that special. A great and, special. And uh, and actually, uh, uh, my friend Alex Gibney uh, had had a lot to do. Was very involved in that. And it was um, a wonderful special. That was when I found out that 
Tom Jones was not the cornball I thought he was. Tom Jones was an amazing blues singer, and I never even knew that. It's a shame anyway, that didn't yeah. come to the surface more in his actual thing. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I was struck by how pretty much all of these Elvis songs sounded so much like songs uh, done by black singers uh, on that series, and presumably at about that time or even earlier. In other words, what I'm saying is just a commonplace observation that Elvis Presley, who, as you said, grew up around black people, drew very heavily on black cultural currents, and I'm sure he wouldn't deny that. You don't deny it, but you can imagine uh, a certain resentment uh, taking shape uh, among some black people if the feeling was, wait a second, we've been doing this for years and years, and suddenly you get this white guy to do it, and he's, a, you know... And it's and he goes national in a way that none of these black guys have. Um, you can imagine the the meme developing that hey he stole this from black people, and then from there you can imagine you know the way rumors build, uh, it, you know and re you know are kind of self reinforcing. You can imagine the myth being started that he kind of ripped off black people and didn't like black people or whatever. That's my theory that we'll never know. But you would certainly not deny, and in fact, you note his influences and draw pictures of, of, of uh, people who both influenced him and were influenced by him, and a number of them uh, number of them are black. I'm holding that part of the book up right now. But anyway, that's a a theory. You certainly would would not deny that he was in that sense derivative. Um, he was derivative. You know, I I had a, um, a that word derivative. I had a, a teacher named Robert Guathme at Cooper Union. He was our freshman drawing teacher. He was also, by the way, he grew up in the South. He was a white person who grew up in the South and was very upset by the racism. And he devoted a lot of his career to painting uh, the sharecroppers he remembered from his childhood. But anyway, and he, you know, he was. But anyway, he said, "Early works." He was talking about painting. Early works are always derivative. I mean, this is true in any creative art mm -hmm. anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean. Bon where would Bonard be, the painter Pierre Bonard, without Monet? I mean, where would you a know? A question where, I've and, often and, asked and, myself, Mark. What? A question I've often asked myself. <laughs> just kidding. I hadn't heard of Bonard actually. But anyway. well, you said he's a great painter. But yeah. but let me just. I just want to read you a quote from Jackie Wilson. First place, as the point at one point I tried to make in my in this in in my book was that first of all I made it clear Elvis Presley did not. <laughs> invent rock and roll. Right. He never claimed to have invented rock and roll. He humbly said that a lot of these black, even in that, in the article that we have there, he humbly says, you know, he couldn't sing as well as Fats Domino or Arthur Crudup, I think I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, these black singers who, um, who you know, had preceded him. And But because Elvis, you know, and, and, and Sam Phillips, who was trying to help black musicians, black human beings in the in the South, and just generally fighting mm -hmm. racism, you know, by by recording these people. At some point, he said because he was he was he would he would record these songs, and they would and they were lit, you know, the, the, like the a lot of the black R and B and blues and everything was 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 on the race. It was like race music that was separate, and then there was the mainstream white music. And he said at some point, if I could find a white singer who could sing like a black man, I could make a million dollars. Well, that turned out to be Elvis Presley. Right. But people missed the point. When I was a kid, what happened was, you know, the, as, as, my, as my book, Shake, Where I Live, Turn That Noise Down, as my book demonstrates, um, you know, when I was a kid, my parents gave me a... Um, a, uh, a, radio. a radio, okay? And, this and is the how radio the book initially, starts. there was Patty Page, there was Perry Coma, there was all this very tame stuff. And, and it wasn't until Elvis came along. You know, suddenly Elvis came along and boom, it was an explosion. Well, what, what happened with Elvis? The next thing, I'm turning on my radio and I'm listening to Little Richard singing, uh, Keep a Knockin' But You Can't Come In, Good Golly Miss Molly. I'm listening to Chuck Berry. You know, people, I just love these guys. They were, they were amazing guys. I never heard these guys on my AM radio until Elvis came along. A lot of those people had careers. I don't mean I got to stop myself from ranting, but just let me rant for a little, just a, a half a minute, okay? Rant on. Yeah, it's you know Elvis Presley did not own the record companies that ripped off black artists, and and you know Elvis Presley opened the door so that when I so that like years later I was a huge fan of James Brown. I saw him live probably more than any other. 
um, you know, musician. And and I never would have heard of James Brown in 1954. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, he couldn't. James Brown couldn't have just gone on the radio and and you know and, and hit mainstream America. He would have been in a little pocket somewhere in the South, and mm-hmm. it would have been called race music. You know, Elvis did the crossover, and there were racist, white racist people who were who were you know angry at Elvis and making a big stink about Elvis because he was you know he was you know they thought he was lowering himself and he th- thought he was ruining every whatever um, based on racism. There were also religious people that were that were um, upset about Elvis, even though you know Elvis. Elvis didn't like being called the king. He, he, he actually said Jesus was the only king. But, you know, Elvis took flack and was controversial. And after he broke through, that opened the door for, for I mean, all these black musicians who've had these amazing careers. And Jackie Wilson was one of my heroes also. And he was a black uh, singer. And this is a quote, from a famous quote from Jackie Wilson. He said, A lot of people have accused Elvis of stealing the black man's music, when in fact, almost every black solo entertainer copied his stage mannerisms from Elvis. Hmm. Now, look, Elvis had influences. You know, if if Elvis's influences had only been Perry Como, probably, you know, the the popularity of, of rhythm and blues and rock and roll and all these black musicians would have been delayed even further. Mm-hmm. And, and it is interesting, uh, just one more sentence, just that, you know, this happened, this happened just, and I can't remember, the, the Montgomery bus strike, was that about 56 or 50, wait, was that 56? Uh, I don't know. Well, it was somewhere in the mid-50s, but basically, you know, it's like Elvis was opening a door in terms of race, around the same time that the civil rights mm-hmm. movement was starting to pick up steam, mm-hmm. and that was a contribution. You know, just like, look, we haven't gotten rid of racism today, but it certainly is a great thing that, you know, like Oprah Winfrey is a big superstar. You know, it's like, it's like um, the, all of these things contribute to, to, to evolving people's minds, and, and I, ju- I just think it's, um, yeah, anyway, uh, the other thing is that Nat King Cole, as I said, Nat King Cole did a cover of Bing Crosby's White Christmas. Sam yep. Cooke did a cover of Patti Page's um, uh, Tennessee Waltz. And Louis Armstrong did a cover of Carol Channing's um, Hello, Dolly. Now, nobody accused them of, of racism. Right. You know, it's just, um, it just, you know, music and creative arts and, and science and even, you know, all the ways that, that human beings evolve yeah. You know, people learn from each other. Why should he have segregated out black people and said, I can right. only try to sing like Dean Martin and Perry Como? Right. I mean, maybe what we can say is, having successfully squelched the Elvis as racist Good. meme, that uh, maybe it's not a tribute to the, to, the, to the state of the consciousness of America at that point, that it did take a white person and, to, yeah, to, no, to, it's to sell this kind of music. But that was the situation, and it was better... We're better off than not having found a person who could make the crossover and then have the cross-fertilization and the inter-ethnic awareness and so on that has ensued. Yeah, I mean, that's all. I, that's what I, you know, that's why I point to that, uh, the Ted Kennedy quote and whatever. He should just be seen for what he was, yeah. you know, and not be seen for what he wasn't. Um, I agree. Speaking of what he was, here's a pretty fetching picture of a young Mark Stamity that I'm, that I'm, uh, holding up to the camera right now, and, uh, and, uh, you, uh, so this really had, like, an impact on you, and, and, I mean, you, you as a kid, okay, so it freaks your mother out, you know, she thinks the, that the radio that I give you is going to be this innocuous thing, and that you're going to be, uh, you know, it'll, 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 it'll just deepen your immersion in the kind of music she approves of, and there's this funny panel where you have, uh, you, 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 you switch to the classroom where the teacher is saying, you know, uh, kind of uh, bringing you some classical music that your mother approves of. And she says, this next piece is called Symphony Number no. 39 or something like that. And it's, uh, it's, just, it's just such a funny way of conveying how boring that must have seemed to all the students in contrast to this liberating... Uh, influence you found in Elvis Presley, you started doing these Elvis Presley imitations, um, and by the way, uh, as an aside, you later did one uh, in the White House for President Clinton, uh, and he, he reciprocated by signing a, uh, an Elvis Presley tie for you, but anyway, it, it had a profound 
kind of psychological impact on you, I guess? I mean, I, I'm almost wondering, you know, we started out by saying that you have, although you certainly acknowledge the influences on you as a cartoonist, you've kind of broken some new ground, I would say, and I'm kind of wondering whether uh, you were empowered to do that and inspired to do that by uh, your early identification with uh, a singer who was considered a radical in his own day. Well, I would say that, you know, all of, like when I talk about trying to work from an intuitive place and the internal mystery, you know, it's like, um, you, you know, the, the best work, I think, comes from a feeling, you know, now a feeling with a thought, a feeling about a thought, whatever, but, but the thing is, what Elvis was, was that mysterious feeling. Like, I just, I heard that music, and it was something that was completely, I just, it just made me, want to jump around and move and dance. I didn't know what it was. It was just a thrill. And 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 then, you know, I it it, it it and and it also at the same time in some way was like something deep in me that sort of I maybe I sensed was there, but um it you know it was sort of familiar at the same time it was all new but because it was kind of like something I don't know, you know, we something you kind of intuitively seek after. And um and that, so it, it, it unleashed a feeling, and it unleashed expression, you know, and, um, and you know, that's what, I mean, that's what the creative work comes from, and, you know, trusting our feelings. So, you you know, you have this sound burst into my room, and, and, um, and, and, and then it's, like, experiential, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, then I'm in, like, where does this take me? And that's really what the best creative work tries to do, is get to a feeling that takes me somewhere. So, yeah, it was all, you know, it was all kind of um, re related in that way. Yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of funny because when I came to, I guess, cultural awareness um, in the early 1960s, and what was just starting to happen then was the Beatles. One of my first memories is that one of my older sisters, Becky, was going to an actual Beatles concert. This is like 63 or whenever they toured. I think it's the first American tour, 62, in the Washington, D.C. area where we lived then. And my first consciousness of Elvis Presley is of him being a little passe and eventually kind of emphatically uncool, you know? I mean, yeah. in fact, I remember in the late 60s, he came out with this, you hadn't heard much of him on the radio, and then he came out with this song called In the Ghetto, which struck me as such an obvious and strained attempt to become relevant, you know? Right. And it was, it was a big departure from his earlier, his earlier songs hadn't been political, and it was a departure in tone, and, and uh, it's, so it's kind of funny... I mean, not that I didn't know that he shook the world up when he showed up, but to be reminded that the guy was considered a total ra kind of radical, and and a major and and in and in some corners a real threat to the establishment, um, was just just a kind of uh, uh, surprising. Um, well, I would say this, you know, when when in the ghetto came first place, I was really in love with fifties Elvis, especially. Um, mm -hmm. I did see him later in his jumpsuit in 1972, and he was he was great. I think he did a great jumpsuit show and all that stuff. His ben. movies mostly were horrible, but I want to say about <clears throat> In the Ghetto, you know, in 58 he was drafted, and also the Dodgers went to Los Angeles, and that was a very traumatic year for me. But, but basically, <laughs> um, you know, after he came back from the Army in 1960, he was sort of tamer and whatever and when he did in the ghetto i had the same exact reaction you had i thought jesus you know he's trying to be bob dylan by that time i was a big bob dylan fan and still am to this day mm -hmm. and i think it's sad that elvis wasn't able to you know evolve you know kind of have a sustain himself the way uh, you know uh, bob dylan has but nonetheless um when he, I had that reaction about in the ghetto. I thought, oh, he's trying to be Bob Dylan. He's trying to, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you know, in the last couple of years, um, I have to say, or, or maybe I, I've, I've, I've thought about that song. And here's what I would say: was um, apparently that song meant a lot to him, and apparently uh, people, you know, advised him not to record it. But the thing about that was, was Elvis grew up poor. You know, Elvis was Elvis knew what that meant. You know, mm -hmm. and and so. Um, so I would say that uh, that Elvis really, there was a genuine um, quality to that. And also, you know, Bob Dylan grew up, I think, middle class in Minnesota. So um, so yeah. it's, it's arguably, um, you know, Elvis had the sort of street cred 
to uh, to record a song That's a good like point. that. Look, Nonetheless, I, at the time, I had I the same reaction. I think you could do a, that I think you do a major critique of Bob Dylan in terms of the sincerity or lack thereof. I'm say that, say that again. Well, I, I don't want to get off on a tangent. I I, I I watched a long special about Bob Dylan that gave me serious doubts about the guy, and I could get off on that, but I won't. But but I take your point that Elvis's credentials are at least. Uh, as as uh, are better than Bob Dylan. You know, well, I, and I don't I don't really want to put down Bob Dylan. With, you know, that's a, that I mean, do. but, but the, the, <laughs> because I because I that's another conversation. But the yeah. and I, and and I actually probably would uh, be on the, I might be on the other side of that conversation. Maybe. Probably but, that would but be the, a good conversation. But the thing I would say is just the fact that Elvis grew up poor, and to right. sing a song like that, he knew what poverty was. So, yeah. you know, it's, um, but I, I never liked, you know, I, I never liked that song, and I, and when he recorded it, I, I did kind of mm. think it was silly, but... Um, now, an interesting question, in terms of the fact that by the mid-60s, he did seem a little passe, the Beatles and, a, and Dylan, a bunch of other things were what was really happening. Elvis himself, I once heard him express the view that he had made a strategic mistake, basically, he didn't put it that way. But the decision was made, and I think maybe made by his, you know, his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, but it was made by somebody, that rather than tour and do concerts, beginning in the very late, when he got back from the Army and, through, and during the early 60s, he, he would make these movies, you know, Jailhouse Rock, whatever. And we're all that was actually before uh, it was. He came back and did GI Blues. I think Jay, Jailhouse Rock he made before um, he went away. But yeah. Uh, oh, did he really? Yeah, but he made a lot of crappy movies. Progressively crappy movies. He focused movies on bad movies instead of concerts. And he, I heard him later express the view that that was why he was eclipsed by the Beatles. Now that may be giving then, too little credit to the Beatles. And then he, and then he, <coughs> he, then he did that stage. You know, then he did go on the road after that. Finally, he got fed up. You know. Yeah, but and it was his, his jumpsuit years, he did. He he was good in his jumpsuit years, but it wasn't. That yeah, wasn't but the whole there. idea of centering his career around Las Vegas showed to me such a, you know a, an out of tuneness with the times. The, Las Vegas yeah. was the opposite of what was happening culturally in America. At sure. That time. No, I, I I mean I I you know that I I um, I, I, I wouldn't uh, present him as different from that. No, I mean he was. I mean politically, he was. You know, if you read about the, uh, oh, the, the thing whole, where he visited Nixon and yeah, all this stuff. Yeah, I forgot stuff about is, that. So he, he conned, and we now know <laughs> that he had more than a passing acquaintance with uh, with some controlled dangerous substances, but yeah. he conned the Nixon administration into giving him, I just remembered well, this. Well, it wasn't really the administration. You mean that badge? <laughs> yeah, the badge. No, well, it was, it was the, I, I read one <laughs> account of that, and the, there was a book that came out just after Elvis died, and it may have been, Elvis's death may have been partly... Uh, you know, um, expedited by the fact that he knew that that book was coming out. I don't know, but there was this guy who, a Murdoch guy who wrote for the Post, who got a few of the Memphis Mafia who had left Elvis or been kicked out because of they were trying to stop him from ruining himself or whatever. And and they wrote a, a kind of a tell-all thing. And they, they, they're in that book. Uh, there was this thing about. Uh, I've heard different different versions of that trip to the White House, but there's a version in there, and basically it's just somehow he just showed up, he got in, he's there he is with Nixon, and like on the spur of the moment, he he, uh, he gets Nixon to give him this badge or whatever, and you know. It was, but, but it gave him actual powers, didn't it? To, I, as, I'm not as sure if it did. I'm not, sure if, I'm not sure if it did, uh, but I, you know, that it was, that was pretty silly, and, and I, I, you know, I won't defend any of that, you know, there, yeah. there was some you know, there was some silliness. Well, was at he some was point. he conservative politically? In, in well, his I, well, heart? you know, now I've 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 read that he donated money to civil rights movement, whatever, and mm -hmm. I, you know, in the '60s and whatever. And I've read that. I mean, but politically, I think you might find some somewhat screwy politics with him about. I mean, mixed. I, I you know I, I I don't I don't really know the thing about his politics, and I you know I certainly wouldn't sit here and. Uh, Explain it and defend mm -hmm. it. If it's even, you know, first place, I don't think he was that political of a person. I think he just no. he had impressions about certain things. But I think he was a humanitarian. I mean, I, I think on a one-on-one -on -one basis, he was a humanitarian. Yeah. And um, you know, for instance, like I think, you know, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger is essentially a liberal Democrat. But when he first came to the United States, he said this thing. The reason he became a Republican is because of some. 
he came from, you know, I forget what country, but, you know, he came from behind the Iron Curtain. He comes here and he heard Richard Nixon say some statement about freedom or something, and he decided to be a Republican. And I think Elvis's politics is somewhat, you know, sort of like that, like a little bit kind of like, uh, you know, um, you, you, you know, whatever. Reflexive. Um the, the uh, So anyway, yeah, and, and also on his behalf, I will say, you mentioned his army tour. My father was a career army officer, and the word in the army was, that I got from my father, was that while in the army, he behaved himself, you know, he didn't, he didn't think he was above it. He didn't act as if he thought he was above it. No, I mean, he didn't. He did no. his work, he was, he was decent and polite to everyone, and he didn't ask for special treatment, and so on. No, I think he was. Yeah, I think that's that's true. And I think basically he was a very good and decent guy who who had you know who probably could have used you know five years of therapy at some critical point in his life, but instead he became a superstar. So you know he sort of got distorted. Like mm -hmm. you know the the thing about him um, as opposed to like let's say Bruce Springsteen. You know, compare Elvis to Bruce Springsteen. It's like. Mm -hmm. Elvis was unable, it seems like, to create a really balanced life where he could, you know, want to live to be, you know, 90. You know, somebody like Bruce Springsteen has, a, you know, has balanced his life and, and had a, yeah. you know, and it's just a shame that Elvis was not able to, um, you know, to find his way. And I think he, you know, he, look, yeah. it's a distorted reality. He couldn't walk down the street. And I think he was, a, he was probably at the same time a little afraid to, walk down the street without being mobbed and yeah. you know he, he probably had just you know conflicted feelings about the whole thing but I, I i think the best way to kind of work out your psychological issues is probably not to become a superstar when you're you know 21 that's why i've avoided it because i wanted to maintain <laughs> i wanted to maintain my balance unfortunately that hasn't worked out either but that was the idea yeah so so i guess i guess if we better be careful that blogging heads doesn't doesn't get you're too famous. I'm trying to keep a low profile for it because <laughs> I don't want to get out of control. You know, the the uh, we've all seen what happened to Tiger Woods. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, you got to be careful about that. So yeah, the uh, now, and I would say in Elvis's defense, you know, as you said, he came from a poor background. His father was kind of a ne'er do well. He did not come from a background that prepares a person. To manage a career like this, no, you know Bruce Springsteen. I, I've seen the house he grew up in. It was much more of a middle class deal. Um, and uh, but anyway, I, on this question, do you do you think it's the case that had he not made the decision to do a bunch of schlocky movies, his influence might have endured through the '60s more than it did, or do you think his moment just naturally? Past and his role in cultural evolution kind of passed. Well, I have a certain view of this that's a little, you know. Unfortunately, I think he was, he was, I guess, attached to this whole idea of image and whatever. You know, I, I remember when Don McLean in the back in the early seventies, I think it was Don McLean made American Pie, right. and he made a lot of money. And I read an article in some magazine, maybe it was People or whatever magazine it was, and he said in that magazine, he said, "I now have enough money." to live where I want to live and do what I want to do for the rest of my life. And somewhere around there, hmm. I saw Don McLean give a concert uh, uh, down on the, on the south, the, the shore, the, the whatever, whatever that is, south whatever that's on the, the east side of Manhattan near the ferry, you know, that whole whatever. Before they, was built, you know, they developed it, it was on a dock somewhere. Oh, and he oh. gave this concert. We were all sitting there, you know, and he was there in the front with his guitar. And he sang American Pie and he sang... You know, whatever, you know, Vincent, Vincent or whatever he's saying. And then he uh, and then he just went on and on and on and played like old blues things and old whatever. Just every song, you, you know, just all these great right. things that he loved and knew and just for the joy of the music. And it wasn't some, you know, clipped off set or something. He just loved the music. He was playing the music and he, he, he could do that. And I think the mistake that Elvis made um, it, it was, you know, kind of being attached to this whole... Elvis thing, you know, and and this the, the you know it's like John Lennon, you know, walked away from from the the you know he tried to get to a real place. I think Bruce yeah. Bruce Springsteen and you know in my opinion Bob Dylan got to that real place where you know if somebody is a writer, an artist, uh, a musician, there is the opportunity if you get enough money to pay your bills and if you live within your means, you can just do something you love and you can do it for whoever's out there and you mm -hmm. don't have to be attached to being the king of 
whatever right. or whatever. You know, you know, and 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 I I think it's it's you know he could have lived a life relevant to himself as a creative person, not worried about whether he was number one every week and 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 all of that kind yeah. of stuff. I, I you know I, I think that's really kind of the tragedy of being being attached to uh, in some way. I think you have very mixed feelings about. Um, his image, because there there is a quote of him where at some point toward the end of his life where he says he's tired of being Elvis Presley, and and you know, I, that's why I talk about this internal thing about going into you know like like an artist has a chance to go within, and and have a a kind of a a, a flourishing place within, and yeah. if the bills are paid, you know the annoyance for an artist is. You have to pay these bills, you know, yeah. and, and if you got your bills paid, you can live in that place and find whatever audience you find without having to, you know, beat the Beatles or something. I'm with you. And this is a good, you know, we're at an hour now, so we got to kind of wind it down. But this is a good note to close on because it does bring us back to you, actually. I mean, I think, you know, it's clear from your remarks that you would ideally uh, associate yourself more with the kind of person who you know, follows the muse or whatever, follows the bliss, follows the artistic impulse, and just tries to, to construct life such that that's possible, as opposed to the kind of person who pursues uh, celebrity for its own sake. And I will say, uh, in a closing testament to you, that I've met a number of people who I had heard of before I met them, who are in the creative arts, um, and you're one of them. And sometimes... When you get to know them a little, you get the feeling that uh, they are talented, but 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 they're less. They have less of the kind of the artist's uh, character than you might have anticipated. In other words, they're a little more calculating than you would think, and you get the impression that that, that they kind of almost did a market analysis and went out and created what the market wanted. And I will say that with you, I've always had the impression that you are the genuine article. I mean, <laughs> you are, first of all, as eccentric as I would hope any kind of artist would be. Um, and secondly, just that you've got your own vision, and to the extent that the world appreciates it, that's good. You welcome that, and you encourage it, like anyone would, but you are not a slave um, to the drive for uh, for adulation, and I think um, that's why your stuff is so great. Well, God, well, thank you very much. I I really appreciate you saying that. I'm very touched. And uh, well, uh, before you have a chance to burst into tears, Mark, <laughs> I guess we'll we'll uh, let me show people the book one more time. Um, there it is. Hardly recommended, along with all of your work, including Who Needs Donuts and. Uh, whatever copies there are uh, of McDoodle Street and, and your other stuff, including one about an, uh, a Rocky uh, librarian or something. But we'll, we will link to all your books, Mark. Oh, thank you. We'll That's wonderful. That I, I really appreciate that. And, and, and we'll link to anything else. And yeah, and this, uh, uh, this is really great. I mean, like I said, I'm a huge fan of Blogging Heads, so it's really great that I actually am on Blogging Heads. Finally, you have arrived, Mark <laughs> Allen Stanley. Yeah, the Congratulations. Pinnacle. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, thanks again, Mark. And okay. good, good luck with the book. We'll, we'll, uh, I encourage okay, everybody. Okay, Bob. Now, I just, do I put, what do I push stop now, or what do I do? Uh, well, for now, we'll just say goodbye. Okay. And, uh, and then, yeah, after that, you, you, you push stop. Okay, Bob. Okay. Goodbye. See you, see you Mark.